I largely categorize uh, three pillar technology that are important to mobile computing uh, in the application processor. Uh, number one is communication capability, the number two is the compu computing capability, and third one is multimedia capability. I think uh, it's, there's not much of a debate that MediaTek is traditionally strong in multimedia technology dating back to our products in uh, uh, DVD player, Blu-ray player, uh, digital TV, and now they to tablets and smartphones. So, and then we also w are a leading provider in multi-core, uh, big little CPU architecture uh, w without any overheating problem using our uh, core pilot technology. So I'm gonna start with a, a little bit talk on the communication side in particular. So uh, our first generation LTE uh, modem, MT6290, uh, was first mass produced uh, middle of last year. And it was used also in the SOC product MT, uh, well, it's, at, it's actually called Helio X10 and some follow-on uh, SOC product. It's a FIMO LTE modem. By FIMO, I mean LTE, TDD, FDD, two modes there, and then WCDMA, TDS-CDMA, as well as GSM. Then we follow that with our second generation LT modem, which becomes a seven mode. We added a two mode, which is CDMA 2000 and EVDO. This allows us pretty much to address the, the requirement from the majority of the uh, worldwide operators. And this is uh, using our Prada MT, uh, 6735, which is received pretty well by the market. And I'm happy to say that we uh, very quickly, we have now our third generation LTE 7 modem, which has added the uh, carrier aggregation capability and data rate up to 300 megabits per second. This is used in our uh, Helio P10 product and is also used in our X20 product that the uh, Jeffrey just mentioned. And uh, following that, next year we will have our fourth generation products that will have more carrier aggregation and support data rate up to 450 megabits per second. And we anticipate that uh, in 2017, we all again have our fifth generation modem uh, with uh, data rate probably up to uh, gigabits per second. But Data rate is one thing, so you know, we, we know that for 3G, we probably support data rate up to uh, sub 100 megabits per second level. And with 4G, we start to have a data rate starting from 100 megabits per second. And as my, I mentioned, gradually to uh, 2017 or so, we will have a gigabit per second 4G. And along the way, it's, uh, data rate is not the only thing. Uh, carriers are uh, deploying more and more small cells, and we as a uh, mobile modem provider, we will have to have the capability to, to cope with the interference that come with a small cell deployment. So we have very, very effective uh, interference cancellation techniques built into our modem, uh, which we think have a leading performance. And then also we are looking into developing modem that are used, that can be used for machine type communication, which is M2M. And going to a little bit into 4G, sneak peek over, peek over there is, uh, I think there are, there are many, many things that, that we, can, uh, we, we can add to the existing air interface by looking at uh, non-orthogonal multiple access, you know, a scalable air interface design to address different kinds of application, uh, ranging from very high data rate that data transfer to very low data rate, but uh, delay sensitive IoT devices, and also other applications such as those that require very, very precise and also very, very robust connection. So it's very important to have a scalable air interface design and also a scalable radio implementation. So those are the topics I think uh, what, that's what we are working on uh, for the 5G that's coming up. So I would like to talk a little bit about computing. You know, a, a lot of people 
say, you know, what, what else can be done in mobile computing now that we are up to eight cores or 10 cores, five clusters, and it has more computing power than uh, some of the uh, PC not long ago. Uh, well, as a technologist, I always think that, you know, when people are scratching their heads and cannot find new topics working on this, this become an exciting and a very interesting challenge. And uh, over the last year or so, not very long time, we start to uh, see the uh, emerging trends uh, in deep learning, applying deep learning into mobile applications. Traditionally, uh, the, the, the field is called neural network. Uh, it was a, once a popular no, uh, topic for artificial intelligence experts in academia back in the 70s and 80s when, uh, when I was still in school. But then it died down. Uh, the main reason it was because uh, they were, they were, people weren't able to derive any commercially attractive yet practical applications out of neural networking. Uh, but about 10 years ago, they, they started to have some new breakthroughs through a, a new branch of the neural network theory called convolutional neural networking, uh, which is also sometimes used interchangeably with deep learning. Uh, and it, particularly in the last three years or so, there has been dramatic uh, progress in terms of its application and accuracy uh, of those applications, for example, uh, in 2012, uh, the typical error rate for, or the, not typical, the best error rate for object recognition uh, was around 30 percent. And uh, in 2015, it has improved to about less than 5 percent. And similarly, for speech recognition back three years ago, the error rate was around 38 percent. And nowadays, again, it's about the 5 percent level. So it, it gave us a hope that you know, finally the, uh, the field of deep learning uh, is becoming useful and we'll try to bring it into the smartphone domain. And the improvement, I'll say, is largely result, a result of uh, three in enabling things. First of all, it's, of course, is there are so much more computing power available uh, to us uh, to allow us to, us to do a very complicated calculation. And then there's the advent of uh, highly parallel multi-layer algorithms that, that we can use to calculate the, uh, for whatever we function, mostly cognition function that we try to do. Then with the machine and the algorithm alone, it's not enough. And, uh, and nowadays, fortunately, with the internet, or unfortunately, <laughs> with the internet, there's a tremendously large amount of data or big data available uh, for us to feed into the algorithm and the machine for the training purpose. And with more training and more better training, we are able to do a better cognizant capability uh, into the device. You probably think that a lot of the uh, learning and modeling happens on the cloud side um, by the internet companies such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Ch in China, Baidu, Alibaba, and those, and those guys. Uh, because they have the uh, computing farm, which has a lot of computing power uh, to do the training. And they also have the access to a lot of data uh, that they can, be, they can feed into the machine for training. But we at MediaTek uh, think that we can play a role into, uh, into this as well. In particularly, I envision that uh, we should be able to combine the learning or modeling done in the cloud together with some incremental learning that we can perform on the device. So you can see that you, you get lots of public data to train your uh, devices or train your uh, model, basically, in the cloud uh, with all sorts of variety of data. But then, again, there are some, perhaps some learning you want to do on your own, on your own device. So this will allow the, each user to build a very personalized database, which is private to the particular user of that device only. Right? So for example, I can add uh, pictures of my family members, my friends, and my colleagues uh, in, into my personalized database. 
And I will use this database uh, to do certain things that, that are private or security sensitive. Uh, you can think about applications in, for example, mobile payments. Right? So you, have, you, you want to be very, very secure. You, so you want the, the learning to be done in private. And you also want the recognition error rate to be exceedingly low. Right? So these are the applications. And also, similarly, uh, another security sensitive application is home surveillance. So who would you want to allow to walk into your door in your house? And these things can be changed very quickly. Right? So for example, if you are having a party, then you can, you can uh, upload some pictures into your device or your home surveillance system, and the machine will learn about these guys who will be the guests coming into the house for that party. And you can, of course, erase them afterwards so that they don't walk into the house after the midnight. And having the learning done on the device has another advantage is that the user has the control that it, he or she can update her database very, very quickly when the needs arrive. And then the result will become available to him or her instantaneously. Right, so, the, so that's what, what we think that doing some incremental learning on the device has its own value. So at MediaTek, we try to implement this vision. You know, there are application-specific development kit out there for either visual application or uh, audio or voice uh, uh, applications out there. So it's, it's somewhat fragmented. Then also. Every device's uh, computing environment are not the same, right? So different CPU, different GPU, different DSP maybe, and then also other uh, application-specific processing, such as ISP. So we at the MediaTek is developing a deep learning SDK to serve as a middle layer between the developers and the underlying computing environments, right? So this will allow the, the application developer the capability they can develop one application which can be portable to all kinds of devices. And the SDK will try to minim maximize this usage of the un underlying computing power, whether that's from G CPU, GPU, DSP, or ISP, which become all transparent to the developer. Right? So this kind of ecosystem-friendly approach will allow easy portability and time to market, and also give the application the best performance. As the third part of my talk, I'm also going to talk, uh, touch a little bit on the progress of multimedia uh, technology that we have uh, come up over the uh, last year, uh, just to uh, solidify our leading position in that regard. And in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, video and image uh, qualities. So we have a new technology, what we call ultra resolution. What it does is uh, it takes the pixel by pixel signal processing technique that we have to a different level. So you can tell that on the left hand side is a 480p pictures and through signal processing we can make it look better, clearer, more clear and sharper than a picture taken uh, in uh, three times more resolutions. And this is all done with uh, high, high fidelity scaling and the content adaptive sharpening. All right? So you can tell some of the uh, detail. I don't know whether you can see in the, uh, in the very middle section actually looks better and the frog actually looks better in detail. So this is another testimony how, of how our signal processing technology uh, was able to improve video or image quality. And next one, I think uh, everyone has uh, probably here can, uh, can relate to its health-related uh, uh, technology. It, it looks small, but it's actually very important. It's called Blue Light Defender. You know, medical, we all look at our screen more and more and for longer time as well, you know, no matter it's smartphone, tablets, your laptop, or, or a TV at home. Uh, we all know, or actually medical research suggests that you know, the, 
highly high energy visible light is the uh, the main cause of macular degeneration. No one wants to have that. Uh, so there, there being a need to filter out those harmful uh, spectrum of lights, and particularly the blue light. And uh, you can tell on the on the top part is the uh, the conventional scheme people use to filter out the blue light. Unfortunately, it has the artifact of color distortions, and the picture also loses a, a bit of its contrast. And uh, at MediaTek, we developed the blue light defender uh, technology through signal processing. Uh, while filtering out the same amount of blue light, 65 percent here, so which will make the picture look darker naturally. However, we do we do not suffer from the same color distortion or the contra contrast loss as seen by the uh, traditional schemes. And last, I would like to talk a little bit about another breakthrough that we have. I think the, traditionally the contents available to users uh, were at a fairly low brightness uh, level or small dynamic range, typically in uh, uh, about 100 nits. Uh, last year, the industry adopted open HDR specs, uh, which now allow the, uh, the dispatch of contents up to 10,000 nits. Uh, so the, typically, the contents will be this. Uh, will be sent out or distributed in either a, in both an SDR format and an HDR format. But there are a number of, uh, very, very large number of uh, panels out there, all with different brightness or, or dynamic range spec uh, for your phone, for your tablets, for your, your PC, or for your uh, uh, digital TV at home. And typically, a, a kind of blue force uh, implementation was people would choose whatever co content they can display on their the panel and use that as the, uh, uh, as the source. Uh, at MediaTek, again, we think we, we, we typically have the leave no good things on the table approach. So we will take the best content available that's sent out. We we'll use that as our source, and we will remap the uh, dynamic range to fit the uh, capability of the panel so that even, so when our product compared to our competitors, even though they share the same panel, uh, the picture quality on our product will actually look much better because we maximize the usage of the capability of the panel. So I hope the above short segments uh, give you a glimpse of the progress that we made in the last year and also give you a, a view of what we will be working on for the future.